Okay, um, well, can you see me? Because I, I can't see you, all of you anyway. There you go, okay. Um, I, um, I'm a biologist. I study ways of symbiosis, and uh, I used to work in the chemical industry, and I started building living machines in Texas. I spent 25 years in Texas, so, so maybe Richard Teague or somebody can tell me what this is. Osage Orange. How many people knew that? Wow, okay, so this is a pretty smart group, because I didn't, this came from uh, Central Park in New York City, and I had never seen one, and we didn't know what it was. So it'll be part of the, part of the presentation. Um, this, uh, I, I drew this chart in Seth's office with the magic markers and, and, um, and I pasted in some pictures and he said he could digitize it. So that took about three months and, and, we, <laughs> and it was kind of a dare because I, I thought, well, if I'm wrong, somebody will tell me where I'm wrong. I believe this much more now than I did then. Okay, so you'll see that again. And uh, how do I change things? Oh, that one, okay. So, um, and I'm trying to see, who's, have we got five more minutes yet? Okay. Um, Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, I was really happy. This is an organization that's all my friends, and uh, I really didn't do very much. You know, I kind of was cringing about the idea of putting on a conference, but how, how did they do? <laughs> And, the, and then they got a crowd here, and I got to have stage time, and I like that. So. so what are the consequences of loss of biodiversity? And you're probably very familiar with these. Climate is fourth on my list. Uh, disease processes, food, both quality and quantity, and fresh water. So, so, you know, and then you can, find, you can find me there, so if you want to write that down. So I'm going to go back to the days when there were a lot of Osage Orange on the planet. There's people now talking about the sixth extinction, the sixth major extinction episode. And uh, this is North America. Yeah, we used to have lions. They usually have it uh, being pretty cold because in the Pleistocene it was pretty cold a lot of the time. We had, um, so these are mammoths. You know, I'm going to bring a the, the, the elephant in the room into the conversation here. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking, this article came out last year. It says 97 genera, 97 genuses of large animals disappeared in the Americas and Australia in nature. And then big animals are like nutrient arteries of the planet. And if they go extinct, it's like severing those arteries. These big migrations from the lowlands up into the highlands, um, often driven by predators, uh, would bring tons and tons of poop. And we now have a poop paucity predicament. And um, PPP. So I wanted to add to that, um, what, is, what does the first picture look like? And, 200 years ago, last year, John James Audubon sat and watched three days of passenger pigeons go by. He estimated 300 million per hour. So there's several billion, and you know, that's corroborated by a lot of people. Uh, how much poop did they bring from the south every spring to places like where I grew up in Pennsylvania? And how much poop went south, you know, in the fall? And is, was that important? And um, the other one, the, the sockeye salmon, I want to say Helen, we got salmon into the picture. And that's a grizzly bear. And how big is that fish? You know, the nutrient pump for the West Coast, the salmon would die when they spawn. We don't have that on the East Coast. Those really erosive areas out there had a nutrient pump right out of the ocean. And 99% of that fishery is gone on the Columbia. And I thought, what if we could bring that back? I think that's one of the things we ought to think about. All right. <laughs>
So Seth showed this picture, and I wanted to stop at this point. I, I like to think more intuitively and more in pictures and so forth, and try to think about what it was like and what might be possible again. In the background, you see the big herds of buffalo, and you know I hear 30 million, I hear 60 million. Um, how many were there? Um, imagine if you're in a herd of 100,000 buffalo, and um, what do you think? You're having to pack pretty close together because there's a lot of wolves around, a lot of mountain lions, uh, uh, maybe bear, and so you're kind of protecting your young. What do you think it starts to smell like after 18 hours? It smells like there's not, not a poop paucity predicament there. <laughs> I think what happened is the herds could smell the sweet grass. You know, we've got Dan Kittredge talking about the bricks and the high sugar stuff, and that's a, a way that the grass uh, or vegetables or whatever, that's their immune system. If they can make a lot of sugar, they can make the, the molecules they need because, you know, sugar is the energy. And imagine these herds going to the sweetest grass. They're not going to come back to this area until it smells sweet again. So just imagine that. And now think about, well, what happened to that grass? And my estimate, how much carbon do we lose per acre out there? Somewhere between 100 and 200 tons of carbon per acre. This is in New Mexico. And people out there now say, well, big blue stem, that must be an invasive species. But this is a remnant uh, years and years ago, and it's waiting for the animals to come back, I guess. And they're, they're having a hard time. Um, I, I have a lot of pictures from Texas. So what's, what's this look like? It's cotton. It's the size of school buses and they're getting ready to haul it off. How much uh, bare ground do you see exposed to sunlight? How much uh, black earth do you see? Um, this isn't far from, uh, this is up the road from Vernon a ways. And Richard, do you recognize that? What is that? It's uh, the Red River. It's a huge drainage area. This is in November. This is not the height of the summer or anything like that. And do you see any stream at all? You see a lot of, a lot of dirt bike tracks and stuff. So, um, you know, I, I cry for Texas when I think about this. All my nephews and nieces are, are living in Texas now. They're living actually in McKinney near Dallas. And they're trying to grow, uh, grow hay here. And you can see you're, you're down to bedrock, you're down to caliche. And um, I've got some of that here, I'll show that later if you want to. Um, so I'm kind of thinking, how do we get back to when it last worked? You know, and uh, so the soil extinction. The first part was the megafauna loss, we lost a big nutrient pump. But imagine what happened when barbed wire went into the west and they, the herds couldn't move to sweet grass. And in the West Texas, in the Dust Bowl area, um, they didn't plow at first. They, were, they, were, they got rid of the buffalo. Um, the 4th Cavalry, Mackenzie's Raiders, of which I was a member when I was in Hawaii. Um, I was the, off, the medical operations officer for three years. The 4th Cavalry, Mackenzie said, if we get rid of the buffalo, the Comanche will be starving to death, and we can finally claim Texas. And that's what they did. They ran the buffalo off. Uh, John Wayne in Red River came in with his, his cows, and uh, they went all the way out to the Pecos, because there was still grass out there at that time. But uh, over time, it got harder and harder, because they started to fence in the lands and so forth, and they didn't have a plan and then the war came, and everybody wanted to plant grain, because you could make a lot of money planting grain during wartime. After the war, the grain prices went down, and um, so everybody said, well, we can just plant three times as many acres and make a lot of money. 
So what happened in the 1930s is the land just blew away. And that was uh, the tragedy. Things got a little bit better, but then came the era of the chemical fertilizers and so forth, and we've pretty much killed the life in the soil altogether. And uh, people have been talking about the insects have disappeared. Has that ever happened? Has the soil disappeared itself? Have we had an extinction episode where the soil's disappeared as, as a living system? We are inhibiting photosynthesis on at least 10 to 15 billion acres because it's bare ground. There's no photosynthesis going on. Well, for, for a, a thought, there's 60, million, 60 billion <laughs> acres of land worldwide. Okay, planet Earth. So a huge chunk of that is just not doing any work, as, as Peter Donovan would often help us remember. Um, we are inhibiting humification, which is the Christine Jones, the liquid carbon pathway idea. The agriculture chemicals are pretty much making sure that the plants don't feed anything to the fungi networks that need it, because they're getting free nutrients that we pay for, or it's subsidized by anybody here that pays taxes. So, so I, I, as a biologist, I wanted to go back and think about what, what causes extinctions? And uh, this is what got me all upset about, was 2007, it was November. And um, if you look at the second paragraph there, let's see if this works, okay, can you see that? Is, are we having an extinction episode happening again right now? What, what Peter Ward was figuring out was that uh, most extinction episodes are caused by the oceans going anoxic and they start dying from the bottom up and the result is hydrogen sulfide coming out in great amounts. And they weren't sure about that until about 10 years ago and Ward is going around trying to find out if that's true and he says, well, you know, the paleontologists know that this happens and they're not in the conversation. So he's... So hopefully today Tom changed that. I think that's, that's a great idea. So this book is, he wrote it for normal people that have grandchildren and stuff like that to think about uh, what kind of world do you want to live into. And uh, he really didn't have an answer at the time. And um, what did I do? Where's my help? Where's my help? <laughs> <laughs> that was a demonstration of how good the staff is here. So, so here's a, think about this. CO2 levels rise rapidly. Ward figures out this is probably the fastest it's risen in any way that we can measure it. Uh, we lose the polar ice. The ocean goes anoxic. The, the polar ice is what keeps the, the currents going in the, in the oceans. And uh, if you get, the, get it to the point where the Arctic is as warm as the, the equator, or closer to, then we lose that mo motion. So ocean anoxia and then H2S comes out, and maybe you can see some of the green stuff. The land is kind of dying here. So this is a, a feature I want to avoid. And uh, so that's where we get to where uh, the, the introduction. It's, it's funny how so many people said all the things I wanted to say today. <laughs> when you understand the power of self-organization, you can begin to understand why biologists wor worship biodiversity even more than economists worship technology. Okay, biodiversity is the wisdom that made this planet work. And whatever we do to, to come, overcome this extinction episode that we seem to be getting into, is 90% uh, of the wisdom is in other species. And I'm not saying anything new here, but I thought um, when, when Meadows looked at the, she spent a decade working on this, because I saw earlier formations of it, and uh, she ended up with 12 ways to intervene in a system, and the first one was numbers. And you know, we talk a lot about numbers, we have meetings about numbers, thank you, F five minutes. Uh, that's another number. 
but mostly the numbers are not worth the sweat put in them. He says the system tends to adapt and change. We tend to get too attached to that particular number. And what we ought to be doing is thinking about the health of the system. It's kind of like having a kid. I'm going to run over and get some water here. Again, the, the staff has been amazing. So these are the four that I, I, I saw that and I said, wait, that's the 12th best way? And I went down to number four, because that was something I knew something about. Self-organizing systems, ecosystems, and I thought, well, I spent a lot of time with John Todd in Living Machines and uh, building a greenhouse in Vermont to treat sewage. But I was also building these systems in a chemical plant. I'll show you a little bit more about that. Goals are what Alan Savory was amazing at. You know, once he figured out the biology, he had to figure out how to help humans think about what it is they wanted. And I, I living in Texas in the 90s, I got to meet Alan and hang out with a lot of ranchers out in West Texas, the, the Maddoxes and Peggy Sechrist and some of those folks. But ultimately, the most important idea is, is paradigms. And I want you to know about some people that, I've got a list of four people that if you read everything they wrote, you're going to learn a lot about how nature works, at least from my perspective. So, And this is John Todd. He hardly wrote anything, so don't try to find his stuff. <laughs> but uh, I learned self-organization in this kind of way. Uh, I'll show you what happened. This is on Cape Cod. This is uh, Harwich in the 1980s. 1988, I think they started this. And that lagoon is septage waste that is hauled and put on, I mean, Cape Cod's sand. <laughs> and so they're bringing their septage and they're maybe 50 feet above the water table. And, um, and they're just throwing it in there along with cranberry waste and pesticides and so forth. And John thought, well, if we can build an ecosystem that can treat that stuff, and do you see all these tanks here? You know, he got all these tanks. He lined up 17 fiberglass tanks, about 150 gallons apiece, and started running it through. And, you, you, well, you can see that's the dirty end, right? And he had fish on this end, and because the tanks are all connected, they eventually, as the system got smarter, um, the trick is to learn how fast to run it, but as the system got smarter, the fish started moving upstream. And um, so this is what I did at the chemical plant. Now, it took me, just to give you a sense of paradigms, it took me four years from the time I saw this picture and going to all the John Todd classes and, and wanting to know what the formula was. And John would just say, no, you just put everything in there. It self-organizes. You just put it all in there. You know, you find uh, dirty streams, you find clean streams, you find plants and you throw it together. And it was when we finally started doing it, this is, I worked on a chemical plant that had every kind of toxic waste you can imagine, and it ran through a wetland, and there were fish on this end. Fish were the quality control. If they were having a hard time, they'd tell me. And upstream, John would always say, the, the wetland is the part of the immune system of the fish. So we had to have that, and then we started putting stuff through there, and we killed some fish for a while, but uh, what was kind of cool about that was um, we, you know, we'd slow down. We slowed down for a little bit until the fish were doing okay, and then the, the next thing was happened is we found out we could speed up. The system was learning as we, we went along. This is the side of one of the tanks, and you could see big bubbles there of oxygen from a lot of the algae that's grown on the side of the tanks. You've got to turn your head sideways to see this. This is a 12-inch Placostomus, an armored catfish. We bought these uh, when they were 4 inches long, and they grew to be 12 or 13 inches long. And, uh, and that's, we found out that duckweed takes a lot of sulfur out of the water and so forth. So we made some pretty good water. And so I'm, I'm going to start here, because I talk a little bit more tomorrow, but my time has run out. And so we'll just give it back to you guys. But that's a little bit to think about. And just while well, the last slide I'll show is the, the ultimate paradigm person, Lynn Margulis, who just died a couple of years ago, but she taught at Amherst here in Massachusetts. If you, if you want to think about Darwin and what's important about him and how he's been 
interpreted right and how he's been interpreted wrong. Margulis taught me how to think about evolution from a microbial perspective. And that's the most important place to look at it because that's doing most of the work. So, so I'll pick up here in this afternoon sometime. So.